Almost two years ago, a mysterious virus became widely known, prompting a global health scare. Now, after over 7 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered worldwide, just as many of us were starting to enjoy a relative sense of freedom, concern renewed tonight, generated by a new variant, Omicron, proving that the perplexity of this virus continues to evolve and even the sharpest medical minds have a hard time getting in front of it. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, world-renowned chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. A little bit later on, we have Dr. Chris Craterville joining us, who serves as the Global Center for Health Security's Distinguished Chair at UNMC. And you are a big part of this show. In just a little bit, we're gonna open up our phone lines and bring you in on the conversation. But first, Dr. Gold, let's start with the latest data as we know the numbers have been trending up and we all wanna hear your take on Omicron. Well, thank you, Christina. It's great to be with you and with our audience tonight. I hope our audience had a safe Thanksgiving holiday and were able to be thankful for all of the good things uh, that we have in spite of the news that broke uh, over the last weekend. But let's get right to the data. Let's start off with what's going on globally and we'll weave some of the Omicron updates uh, uh, into this early part of our report today. As you said, the numbers globally continue to rise up 14%, 1-4% over the last 14 day period. Over 260 million confirmed cases worldwide, over 560,000 just in the last 24 hours, and indeed over 5 million confirmed deaths worldwide and almost 7,000 in the last 24 hours. Just an astounding set of statistics uh, that continues to spread widely across the globe. When we look at the map, again, uh, we see the largest case growth uh, is in Eastern and Western Europe, parts of the Middle East, but still a significant amount in the Soviet Union. Uh, in the continental United States, uh, in certain parts of the uh, Indian subcontinent uh, as well. Uh, When we look a little bit more closely as to what's going on uh, in our nation, uh, we see that the trends uh, after the peak of the Delta spike that occurred several months ago uh, started to rise again, slightly lower over the last uh, five to seven days. But I would not get too much hope around that because of a significant amount of under-testing and under-reporting over the Thanksgiving break. And so really it's going to be what occurs in the next 72 hours or so uh, that will really tell the tale on what's going on with case transmission in the United States. Let's hope that the numbers uh, continue to fall. The map continues to follow the trends. It shows that our urban and our small rural communities, our farming and ranching communities uh, across the uh, Mountain West, some of the southwestern part of the United States, but particularly the Great Lakes area, uh, New England, et cetera, are seeing explosive case growth. You know, we all know what happened in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and in Michigan several months ago, and now it's almost like they're rewriting that same history all over again. And the southern part of our country, all through Florida, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, most of Texas, has really reduced, not to zero, of course, but has really reduced the case rates in spite of the tremendous transmission that we saw earlier of Delta variant. As we look more closely at the case rate, again, you see that tiny little dip uh, over the last several days, but again, probably artifactual uh, due to the reporting and testing frequency uh, over the holidays. When we look at some of the cases uh, geographically, we see with a U.S. average of 25 cases per 100,000 per day, that Michigan is three and a half times the U.S. average. New Hampshire, New Mexico, Vermont, and Minnesota are about two and a half to three times Uh, the U.S. average, which with some of the highest case transmissions uh, in our nation. Again, both rural and urban communities. And when we talk about the cases, let's be very clear. We're talking about almost 100 percent Delta variant right now uh, in the United States. And that has set the stage uh, for us to think about 
what this Omicron uh, discovery uh, and identification has meant. Now, let's just remind our audience tonight that Delta variant is far more transmissible uh, than the original wild strain. You know, we talk about seasonal flu, just to put this into perspective, that has an R value or a transmission value of a little over one. That means for the average person that gets the flu, they're likely to transmit it to one other person. Polio was about one person got it and <clears throat> three would get transmitted. Chickenpox, much more highly transmissible. So for every one person that would get it, seven or eight would get infected as a result of that. Measles spreads even faster than that. That spreads at a rate of for every person that gets measles, they're likely to infect another 15 people. So Delta variant in that shaded pink box right in the middle of this graphic shows that for everyone who gets it, <clears throat> somewhere between five and eight uh, let's say on average six to seven people will get infected by Delta variant. It is almost five times to six times more contagious, if you will, than the original version of the coronavirus. So let's put that into perspective. We've recently found uh, and identified in South Africa and other African southern countries this new variant, which is called Omicron, uh, sometimes known as B1.1.529. So we've now got a total of five different uh, so-called variants of concern. We remember the alpha variant of the B117 that emerged in Great Britain in late 2020. Then beta came out of South Africa. Delta originally emerged in India in late 2020, spread around the world and caused all kinds of death and devastation throughout India, the entire subcontinent, and is now predominant all through Eastern and Western Europe, and of course, uh, across the United States. And then just over the weekend, we heard about an outbreak of several hundred cases uh, of this new lineage, uh, which is referred to as Omicron, yet another Greek alphabet letter. So let's just unpack that just for a few minutes with our audience tonight. This is an artist's rendering. On one side, you're looking at the top view. On the other side, you're looking at the side view. And this is the spike protein. This is the part of the virus that extends out from its outer shell, called the capsid. Uh, this is where the virus binds to the human cells. And this is particularly important because changes in these binding sites have a major difference in how contagious the virus is, and also whether or not our antibodies that we make in response to vaccines or infection can actually identify this as the same virus. And what you can see is that on the very top of that spike protein, there are a number of very significant changes. Indeed, there are at least 30 significant protein structure changes that have occurred in the spike protein alone, approximately 50 in the total part of the virus, that indicates that it may have a higher chance of being transmitted and indeed may indeed even have a higher chance of escaping the impact of our vaccines and of our uh, natural immunity. And when we look across the world, we can see that the largest density is still in southern Africa, but there are now approximately 10 to 12 countries and many others are actively testing of individuals that have traveled from Southern Africa to Canada, to Great Britain, to France, to Germany, to Australia, uh, to Hong Kong and other places where this unique Omicron variant has been genetically tested. And I think just to repeat what some of our infectious disease experts here in the United States have said, it is just a matter of time until the first case shows up in our country and it's so many other countries uh, around the world. You know, one of the most important considerations that we are looking at very carefully is what's going on with the case transmission rates in South Africa, where this was first described. And I point out to you that little blip on the very, very far edge of the curve, which shows the fastest rate of growth of virus transmission in the history of the three spikes uh, that were identified uh, in South Africa, if you look at these seven-day running averages. So based upon the steepness of their spike, they have 
estimated that the R value for this variant, for Omicron, is approximately 11. Uh, that means it's 50 percent, if that is true, and understand if, there's a big if here, that if that's true, it's 50 percent more contagious than even Delta variant, which would make it 10 times more contagious than the original variant that started out in Wuhan City in China uh, back in the winter of 2020. And that is the reason that you're seeing all of the travel restrictions widely across the United States that has concerned all of the not only uh, regional and, and municipal governments, but the public health individuals. Now, what we don't know, aside from its contagion, and we need more data on that, is whether or not the illness it will cause is more or less severe, the likelihood of hospitalization and death more or less severe, and nor do we know whether it has a higher chance of escaping uh, impact by our vaccines and by previous infection. All of that is information that should be available, hopefully within the next seven to 10 days, if not sooner, based upon the experiences that are, that are ongoing in South Africa. And preliminary data is being collected literally as we speak. And it wouldn't surprise me if we have some preliminary data, not just on contagion rates, but on severity of illness rates and on hospitalization rates, death rates, but also on vaccine escape uh, in the next several days. And, you know, that has to be put into the context of the fact that South African countries have a much lower vaccination rate than we do. We're approximately 59 percent fully vaxxed as a nation. These countries are in the 20 to 25 percent vaccinated range. And therefore, they have a very significant younger population that is not vaxxed. And therefore, we're going to be seeing less of severity of illness in those individuals. So it's going to take a very careful scientific study to really understand what the impact of this is going to be. But, you know, as we've said on this program and so many times previously, out of an abundance of caution, we need to be prepared uh, to deal with this. And hoping that this is not severe and not contagious is not a plan. So the plan has to be, what can we do to stop the transmission of this? And that's do the things that we know work. Masking, social distancing, getting vaxxed. You know, let's face it, we're heading right into the heart of the flu season. We still have a ton of Delta variant in this country that is still spreading very significantly. We're still seeing significant death rates uh, across our country. So to quote uh, Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci and so many others, what we can do as a nation is wear our mask when we're in larger groups, maintain our distances where at all possible, and please, please get vaccinated. And if you are fully vaccinated, uh, please get your booster. So why don't we stop the graphics at this point, Christina, and let's see what we can do to answer your questions and the questions from our audience tonight. Oh, and I'm sure there will be many. I want to give that number out. It's 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions tonight. So it sounds like the WHO raised the red flag because this is 10 times as contagious, as you pointed out. But we still don't know much about the severity of the symptoms or whether or not our vaccines will hold up. Unfortunately, this is a, a tough time because Christmas, as you know, Dr. Gold, is a global holiday and people around the world have made plans for overseas travel. How concerned should we be about our own travel plans at this juncture? Well, so I have been asked that question by many, including uh, family members and close friends. And, uh, you know, uh, what I've been telling them is that if you're otherwise healthy, you're fully vaxxed, if you've had your booster, if you're traveling with children, you know, 5 to 11, who at least have had a single dose of the vaccine, then it's probably reasonably safe to travel. If you travel masked and do or take all the precautions that the airlines and airports, public transportation, etc., always better to travel in your personal vehicle with your family members who you know are fully vaxxed. But for those in our community who are older, for those who are being treated for cancer, for those who have had a solid organ transplant, <clears throat> until the dust settles, I've been advising them uh, to hit the pause button on their travel plans 
And no matter how strong their desire is to be with their family, they really don't want to run the risk of getting infected with Delta or possibly even at a later time uh, with a different variant. And, you know, we have talked about the what ifs on this program many times. It should not be a shock that we continue to find new variants, particularly in parts of the world that have very low vaccination rates or significantly lower vaccination rates, where there's a lot of transmission of virus that continues to replicate in very high rates. We see minor variations in the United States in Delta variant, you know, almost once a week now. But to have 50, 5 mutations in a single lineage of the virus is the most, I think, that we've seen thus far in the pandemic, and hence the concern that we're seeing around the world. I mean, making these travel restrictions is not a small thing to do. It is really changing the travel plans of so many people, particularly as we're moving into the holiday season, as you say. So I'm hoping that we'll have a better understanding before we get to the winter holidays as to all of the details on the safety and on the risk, the transmission and the severity of uh, this Omicron strain. I'm hoping against hope that we don't see many cases uh, in the United States. And if we do, that they're not severe. But, you know, as I said earlier, many times hope is not a plan. We need to be prepared to deal with it in event that becomes a reality. Which brings us back to the importance of booster shots. I know uh, probably at this time next week, when all of our viewers come back and join us once again, you're going to have a lot more information on the Omicron variant. But let's just talk about boosters for a moment. Uh, based on what I've been reading from doctors in Australia, it seems as though the boosting that you get after the third dose of vaccine is quite significant, even compared to the effectiveness of the second dose. What is your take on that? And would it be worthwhile for officials in our country to consider reducing the amount of time that we have to wait to get that third dose from six months to maybe two or three months as that efficacy starts to wane? Well, again, we are try to be driven as best as we can by the science. And so for the Johnson & Johnson virus vector vaccine, the Janssen Johnson & Johnson product that a good number of Americans received, uh, that is at now at two months because the science shows that their ability to fight off these infections and their antibody levels comes down rather quickly. And so they've been recommended to get a boost of any of the vaccines, including the Moderna or the Pfizer, as well as the J&J, &J, at the two-month mark. For the Pfizer and for the Moderna, we're still recommending the, at the six-month mark. And that's because reinfection rates, meaning vaccine breakthrough, and antibody levels, particularly in younger people, seem to be better maintained uh, with those two products. However, depending upon what happens with Omicron, it wouldn't surprise me if we see two things coming in the future. One would be shortening of that interval. So maybe from six months to four months, four months to three months, maybe even less, depending upon age, comorbidities, uh, et cetera you know, frontline healthcare workers, perhaps at higher risk. Uh, and so maybe a shorter interval for them. Other thing that we may be considering uh, is yet another boost. You know, the different vaccines have slightly different abilities to protect against some of these variants. And it may be that one of these vaccines in a yet another shot, either a third or a fourth boost, uh, could actually have a higher ability to prevent not only the spread of Delta, uh, but the spread of Omicron if it becomes a significant challenge. Again, if it becomes a significant challenge in the United States. Uh, the major manufacturers uh, of the vaccines in the United States are all looking right now at the question of the ability of their vaccine to create true neutralizing antibody uh, function against Omicron. They've already worked this out against Delta. So it should just be a short period of time before they can answer the question about this, uh, this new variant. But at the same time, as we've heard uh, from the leaders of these large companies in the U.S., that they're already looking uh, at yet a whole new generation of these vaccines. And the good news is, because of the way they're manufactured, it shouldn't take very much to do a shift to add additional capability 
to the vaccines uh, over a relatively short period of time. But unfortunately, that is not going to be measured in weeks. It's probably going to be measured in the better part of a month or more. And depending on whether or not the FDA is going to require a safety trial, uh, hopefully, uh, if it does, it will be a minimum safety trial because we've had pretty good experience with these vaccines in the past from a safety perspective. The sooner we can get those modifications made, the better off we're going to be as a nation. Absolutely. So Omicron-matched vaccines are a possibility. Again, this is the virus you have to watch and wait on to see what it's going to do. Uh, we always appreciate how candid and transparent you are with our audience, though, Dr. Gold. Speaking of FDA decisions, a recent FDA review found that Merck's COVID-19 pill is effective, but they flagged some safety concerns, and a public meeting will be held tomorrow to discuss whether the drug's overall benefits will outweigh its risks. Would this drug be effective on new variants like Omicron? It should be. Uh, both, as you may know, both the Pfizer product and the Merck product are under consideration by the Food and Drug Administration right now. And that is because they do not solicit uh, antibody response. They don't work on our immune system. They prevent the virus from multiplying, from replicating is the fancy term. And they should have the same effect, at least we hope it will have the same effect. Uh, it would be very important to actually measure that scientifically. But either way, you know, it, it, it's so easy to, to rush to a conclusion on this. None of this is going to be an all or none phenomenon. You know, the vaccines are not going to completely fail, even if they become less effective. They just will become somewhat less effective if that becomes the case. And similarly, these oral medications, hopefully they'll be as effective. They may even be more effective, but they could be somewhat less effective as well. But it's not going to go from all to nothing. Uh, it'll just be a degree of change, which will then allow these companies to continue to tweak and modify the manufacturing processes uh, and to once more look at safety and efficacy and continue to watch the curveballs uh, that this virus continues to toss us. You know, uh, when we were starting to talk about this uh, on RFD, uh, you know, almost two years ago now, I mean, no one would have predicted all of these changes, all of these variants, all of these spikes, all of the issues and challenges that we've had in getting vaccines into the arms of individuals worldwide. Uh, we knew it would be a challenge, and we knew uh, that this was going to be a wild ride, but I don't think anybody would have predicted nearly two years later uh, that, uh, that we'd be confronting with this today. But, you know, that is the reality. As you said, we try very hard to be transparent and scientifically based, and we just have to deal with it as we see it on a day-by-day -day basis. I'm grateful we've had you to guide us through the whole way. On that note, we are going to pause for a break. We know that Wayne from Florida has been waiting on the line. We will get to your question on the other side of this break. I want to make sure that you at home have our number as well. It's 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions for Dr. Gold. And when we come back, Dr. Chris Cradoville, the Global Center for Health Security's Distinguished Chair at UNMC, will join our conversation. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Dr. Chris Cradiville, the Global Center for Health Security's Distinguished Chair at UNMC. He's a man who wears many hats. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Cradiville. Now, Dr. Gold touched on it previously, but the biggest question on everybody's mind right now is the new variant. What can you tell us about Omicron and and how does this affect the pandemic worldwide and in our own local communities? Well, I think uh, one of the key aspects that Dr. Gold was mentioning is that we've really learned a lot about COVID. And regardless of the variant, those core principles are so important. And we were actually talking before the show about rodeos, and, and this really isn't our first rodeo. I think as we've seen these different uh, uh, spikes that we've all had to deal with, unfortunately, uh, we've continued to learn more and more. And we do know that those core principles hold true. Get vaccinated, wear masks, uh, social distance. If you're not feeling well, 
take yourself out, get tested. And, uh, you know, I think if we follow those core things, they're going to be helpful. And the data is going to be coming in very quickly because there's scientists globally that are keenly interested in this, very aware of the, the consequences and collecting data. So as, as Dr. Gold mentioned, as we speak, they're, they're analyzing the data, they're learning more, and that's going to be rapidly pushed out to help guide all of us in how best to manage this new wave. Yeah, well, you are with the Global Center for Health Security, so the work that you do directly impacts all of us. We thank you. We tip our hat to you and look forward to what you're going to add to our conversation tonight. We are going to go to the phones now. Wayne from Florida joins us. Thanks for your patience, Wayne. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you for the program this night, uh, this evening, and also uh, both doctors, thank you for sharing what you are. Question, with uh, antigen levels dropping as quickly as they appear to, um, and with, uh, you know, this new variant, do you see an end to this, uh, at any point in time? Cause I'm also under the understanding that only about 17% of the population in the world has had any exposure to a vaccine at all. You know, Wayne, that's a, uh, that is the question of the day. Uh, and, uh, we'll ask Dr. Craddaville in a minute what his judgment is. I think we're going to continue to see these spikes. I think, uh, you know, over time, what tends to happen to these uh, viruses is they tend to become more transmissible but less severe in the illness, and that we're going to end up with something that looks a bit more like influenza. By the way, this is a good time for me to remind everybody to get their flu shots. because You don't want to get the flu, get Delta, hopefully not get Omicron and then want to travel for the holidays it would be a bad combination. So please do get your flu shot as well. But uh, I think that's going to be likely what's going to happen. I don't think we're going to get to a point that people will not remember what COVID is and that it won't be part of our, you know, routine viral environment that we live with. I mean, we live with probably hundreds of other coronaviruses uh, over time that we've just come to accept. They, they cause a lot of common symptoms. They're, you know, if you think about our kids in preschool, they're always sniffling or coughing or something, and it's usually from one of these types of viruses or another uh, virus lineage uh, that is causing that. We've just sort of come to accept that, uh, and unfortunately, I think this is just going to add to that equation. So, and I also think that uh, over time, our immune systems will get more capable because it won't just be the immunity to the spike protein, but it'll be immunity to other parts of these coronaviruses, the variants that we're seeing. And that will allow us to uh, fight it off more effectively that will produce much less severe illness. I don't know, Dr. Crowderville, do you have a different view on the uh, long-term outcome of this? Uh, hopefully, maybe even more optimistic, if possible. Well, I, I think that the optimism I have is if you look at where we were two years ago and where we are now, we've learned so much. We've developed so much capacity. We've developed capacity for uh, our research arm. We've developed capacity for testing. Uh, the, the various treatments that you've talked about, the vaccinations, and we have more capacity to develop uh, vaccines faster in larger quantities. So each day that moves by, I'm more optimistic that we're better able to respond quickly. And I think if you look at what happened with this variant, I mean, the fact that this was just identified about a week ago, and as quickly as we've moved in helping to, to solve the puzzles of how, how much will uh, the vaccines work, how will our treatments work, what will the course be? How infectious will it be? So I think we're getting much better at uh, tackling these problems uh, more quickly and have more resources to do. So I think that's the optimism, but I do agree that it's likely that this is gonna be with us for some time. Mm. Our next call is from Colorado. Coralie joins the conversation. Go right ahead, Coralie. Hello. Uh, my, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Fa um, Dr. Gold and his team for such a program that answers questions for ordinary people with great clarity. It certainly is well appreciated. My question is concerns the regular uh, variant that we're used, sort of used to. I know that some people are called, uh, some people, even though they're vaccinated, uh, have the virus, and I'm wondering if they experience the long haul 
um, consequences that many unvaccinated people do. Do you have any information on that? Yes, we do. And by the way, thank you for your kind words that uh, we are seeing, uh, unfortunately, some uh, long COVID, as they now call it, uh, in individuals that get infected and that who are fully vaxxed. And that not only includes people that are symptomatic or hospitalized with severe COVID, but unfortunately, it also includes some individuals that are nearly completely asymptomatic or are asymptomatic. That is to say, they've had a high risk exposure. They were with a friend or a family member who tested positive for COVID, so they went and get tested. They feel perfectly fine, as we like to say, looking well, feeling swell, and uh, they get tested and the test comes back positive. And yet they too have a risk of getting some of these long COVID symptoms. So for all of those reasons, we still need to maintain the uh, precautions. Thanks for your question. Okay, next is April of Illinois. Go right ahead, April. Thanks for joining us. Yes, um, I'm an MS patient, and I went and got the Madeira two shots. Now they want me to get the booster, and I take a shot every Sunday night. I think I see enough needles. Do I have to get the booster shot? Well, I think, April, it depends upon when you got your last of the Moderna shots, but uh, individuals with uh, MS and, uh, and other uh, neurological diseases uh, such as that are at higher risk if you get COVID, higher risk of hospitalization, higher risk of ending up in an intensive care unit. And so uh, uh, best advice that I would recall uh, would be to do it. However, the advice we always give on this program is, first and foremost, uh, contact your local health care professional. For instance, the individuals that manage your MS probably have made these recommendations for many, many, many others uh, with MS, and they would give you what their experience is, both in terms of safety and in terms of efficacy of getting a boost. Well, let me ask uh, Dr. Crowderville, do you have any other thoughts for April? No, I think your comments are, are spot on. I think working with your own health care provider is always critically important. Uh, and continuing to maintain that contact because as we're seeing, the data continues to come out. And uh, I think at academic health centers like ours, uh, as we're doing the research, as we're pulling the data in, we're trying to get it out to providers out in the field as quickly as we can. And so uh, staying in contact with your, your primary care provider as well as your, your specialist is, is really important. And Dr. Crowderville, UNMC and the Global Center for Health Security, you were among the first in the world to discover that the virus was airborne and spread through the air. What gave you that idea? And talk about how that's affected the pandemic, especially when we keep in mind this new variant and just how contagious it is. Yeah, so it's a great question. And really, if you look at how we we got engaged early on, it's because we do partner very closely with the federal government and ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response. So at UNMC, we have a federal quarantine unit, which allows us to bring in folks that have high risk exposure and have them in a, a specialized area with negative air pressure that we can observe them and and uh, watch for signs of illness. So early on, we had uh, folks from Wuhan, China, U.S. citizens that were repatriated, and also from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So they, they were brought to us, those that had high-risk exposures, so we could have them in a protected environment, monitor them closely. But one of the benefits of being at an academic health center where we do clinical care, research, as well as training education, is we had scientists who knew that viruses like this can be spread in a number of ways. So early on in our federal quarantine center, we were collecting air samples, we were collecting uh, surface samples, we were collecting samples from the patients. So it allowed us to see early on this potential for airborne spread. And, and again, I think that's that, that strong collaboration with an academic health center, with the federal government, as well as the patients we're caring for. 
Wow. I, I just think it's fascinating because there was such a debate over that at the time. And of course, to this day, everything that comes out of UNMC is sound. And we appreciate you so much. We know how busy you are for both of you taking the time to do this show every week. Sharon from Illinois joins the conversation. Sharon, thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Good evening, doctors, both of you. Thank you very much for your help. And Dr. Gold, I've called a couple of times. One question I asked the last time was about getting the antigen test, even though you thought you had COVID maybe last year and you said they could still be done. Can you tell me specifically what tests we should ask our primary, our primary care doctor that we would like to have done to determine, to decipher between the COVID shots and the COVID um, antigens themselves? Sure. Uh, you want a, uh, a COVID uh, antibody titer uh, that looks at non-spike protein antibodies. So there are a number of antibodies that are, you're, uh, will form uh, if you've had the infection to different parts of the virus. They're called nucleocapsid uh, antibodies, NC uh, antibodies. And uh, that is not caused, elevation of those antibodies is not caused by the vaccine. The vaccines typically raise antibodies to the spike protein, as we've talked about. You remember that little diagram we showed in the opening segment of the show where the mutations were in Omicron. So it's the nucleocapsid uh, antibodies uh, that you're looking for. And so if you had previous infection you pr with the virus, uh, in a reasonable period of time after that infection because all of our antibodies will fall over a period of time no matter how good our immune systems are. Uh, you will have antibodies to both. If you just have antibodies to the spike protein and not to the nucleocapsid proteins, then you will most likely have your antibodies just due to the vaccine. I don't know if that makes sense to you. I hope it does. Uh, but that's what uh, I would be asking for. Now, not every laboratory does those, but most large centers will do them. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Sharon. We appreciate it. Dr. Cradiville, let's go back to you for a moment because you are an expert in pandemic safety. Let's talk about how you lead by example. How are you living your everyday life these days? Do you wear a mask? Are you getting together with family and friends or going out to events or restaurants? What can we learn from the way that you live? So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned with Dr. Gold, we're very transparent and the things we talk about are the things that we do every day. And uh, so certainly I wear a mask a lot and it's just gotten to be second nature. And I think uh, when I'm out and about, I have a mask on, but even in our offices. So we have a lot of folks, uh, you know, everyone's fully vaccinated, but we're still wearing a mask when we're out in the hallway, uh, when we're getting together in groups. Uh, certainly we, uh, those of us that work together are all vaccinated. Uh, we, we do social distance and we do things outside. So uh, certainly we go out and we support our local restaurants, but when we do that, we'll eat outside. And even in uh, Omaha today, it's the upper 60s. So we're, we're not uh, uh, opposed to sitting outside with a coat and uh, you know, having that open air is a, a good way to, to maintain safety. And, you know, when we visited a few months ago, I was just back from Cheyenne Frontier Days. And, you know, that's a, an example of a, a situation that it was outdoors, which certainly helped keep people safe. Uh, but when my wife and I went into indoor areas at Cheyenne Frontier Days, we had a mask on. And, uh, you know, it's those are the, the simple things that you can do, uh, making sure we're vaccinated before we went. And those are things that are helping keep up, us, us safe as well as keep our... Uh, communities safe. So uh, I guess we, we definitely practice what we preach. Uh, I love hearing that. And it's always a little bit easier to wear a mask when you see other people are wearing masks as well. You don't feel like you're the only guy in the store not wearing the mask. <laughs> we are going to give out that number 877-731-6733. Call in with your question. James from Ohio joins the conversation now. Go right ahead, James. Yes, uh, I was wondering if uh, you would agree with uh, Dr. Fauci. I was watching uh, a news program, and they showed Dr. Fauci in 2017 stating 
that it was a conference on vaccines. And Dr. Fauci says it takes a minimum of 10 years to prove if a vaccine is safe or not. Do you agree with that? Well, I, all I can tell you is I usually do agree with Dr. Fauci, but in this particular instance, given the consequences of this COVID pandemic, the death, the hospitalization, people's loss of jobs, our kids not being able to attend school, social events, athletic events, cultural events, our spiritual and religious events, uh, that an accelerated program based upon 10 years of research, it's the same 10 years that Dr. Fauci was referring to, resulted in the development of these vaccines. They were trialed uh, in large clinical cohorts, tens of thousands, and now we have data on hundreds of millions. You know, as was said in the opening segment of the program, there are literally billions of people uh, around the world uh, that have been vaccinated with these vaccines. And so we have the most accelerated rollout of these vaccines in the history of vaccination, which has given us a great amount of experience on both safety and on efficacy of these vaccines. And we know they're not perfect. We, we sir, we absolutely sure, James, uh, that there is no drug, there is no vaccine that's ever perfect. But given the consequences of not doing this, what this would mean to you and I, to our nation, to our children, to our future, and given the incredible safety that we've seen, you know, you think about it, we've got almost 200 million Americans alone that are now fully vaccinated. I mean, that's an astounding number in terms of both safety and efficacy. We know that hospitalization and death rates in those that are fully vaxxed are 13 to 14 times lower than for those that get COVID who are not fully vaxxed. Uh, you know, that, that is a risk-benefit ratio that I think most would be willing to take. You know, it's not like we're talking about a disease that does not have a significant chance of causing hospitalization and causing death. Uh, and now with very high transmission rates, the colder weather, indoor social gatherings, and so many other things, the holidays right in front of us, this is the time uh, to get vaccinated. And as Dr. Fauci, I'm sure, would say that if you have the choice, unless you have some very significant medical reason not to be vaccinated, which are few and far between, the overwhelming majority of the evidence that we have uh, favors getting vaxxed. And that's the beauty and of science. Dr. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Crowderville. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity, Christina. I think one thing that I'll add is if we look at, uh, you know, the U.S. when uh, we went to war in World War II, we really took the whole of the country to tackle uh, a critical issue. Uh, you know, if you looked at our normal approach to, you know, developing ships and tanks and airplanes and munitions, uh, it would have been a much longer period. But we really had the whole of the country's resources uh, pulling in to fight that battle. And I think that's what we've done with the vaccine and the approach to COVID as well. So I think that 10 year may be a typical period to develop it, but if we take all the resources we have as a country and globally, and, uh, and you don't necessarily have to cut corners if you're cutting timelines that it may take for a review, because if you have more people focused on it, you have more scientists doing the research, and you're taking every resource you can to get this through uh, as quickly as you can, but not without skipping steps. So I think part of it's uh, the resources that have been put to this have really been unprecedented in, in the medical community. It could have taken centuries if it wasn't for the virus for everybody to get on the same page for some of the discoveries that have been made in this short amount of time because of doctors like you. All right, we're going to pause for a quick break. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're having a great conversation tonight. We know that Terry is hanging on the line. We will get to your call on the other side of this break. You're watching Rural Health Matters, and we're glad you're with us right here on RFD TV. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight our special guest is Dr. Chris Cradiville, the Global Center for Health Security's Distinguished Chair at UNMC. All right, as promised, we're going to go back to the phones. Terry of Indiana, thank you for your patience. Go right ahead. Terry. All right, we are going to go to Pat from Iowa. Sorry, we lost Terry. Pat, go right ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, and to the doctors, I want you to know how much I, and I'm sure many, many other people, appreciate everything that you're doing, your coordination, your, your interest, your research, everything that you're doing, and most of all, your willingness to explain to people like me who aren't well-versed in uh, medical research, just exactly what all of this means. It's happening so fast, and it's changing so quickly. So to be, be able to hear you talk about this is, is wonderful, and I appreciate that. Now, my question has to do with us in the United States and the CDC. I know this is a global pandemic, and I know there are people everywhere in the world who are working on this, but... I'm a little frustrated and, and frankly, not. I'm disappointed that we're not hearing a whole lot from our own CDC, which has always been um, kind of known to be the gold standard in the world. And I, I don't, I don't hear them a lot. In fact, as uh, quoting someone I read recently, the silence is deafening. Can you tell me what? we can expect from our CDC? Are you working with and through the CDC to coordinate not with, only with other countries in the world, but with people in the United States, just how medical specialists are uh, reacting to and addressing what we're seeing happening now? Thank you for taking my question. Well, thank you, Pat, and I think your point is, uh, is well taken, and it's a very good question. So in, just in terms of what we do here as a uh, well-respected academic medical center, we have partnerships with multiple federal departments uh, and agencies. So everyone from the Department of Defense to the Department of Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, the Department of State, the Veterans Administration, and, and many, many others. Uh, within each of those departments are several agencies. So, for instance, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is an agency within uh, Health and Human Services. The CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is an agency within Health and Human Services. And so as the need arises over time, we have various interactions uh, with all of them. And from our perspective, when we have needed to reach out, when... Uh, there are critical questions regarding data, regarding drugs, regarding vaccines, regarding prevention strategies, et cetera, whether it's been with, within a given agency or a given department, we have found them to be quite responsive to us. Now, what the public may perceive uh, is quite different because a lot of their work does happen behind the scenes in terms of collecting data, uh, doing tests on different virus specimens, uh, looking at different products and, and looking at some of the recommendations that come out of the Food and Drug Administration. And so that is, to a large extent, what I would call behind-the-scenes uh, type of work, not in the sense that it's secret, but just in the sense that it happens without hitting the media, without hitting the press uh, frequently. But, you know, uh, let's ask Dr. Crowderville, because the Global Center for Health Security has had a huge amount of interaction and still does very frequently with our federal government. So, Chris, what do you think about Pat's question? Yeah, Pat, I think it's a great question. I, uh, as Dr. Gold mentioned, we do work closely with the CDC. In fact, one of the key initiatives we're working on with them is focusing on rural and uh, smaller health care facilities, uh, uh, critical access hospitals and things like that, and how can we help support them with infection prevention, infection control. So we do work closely with the CDC. We don't work as closely with them on the communications branch, but I can tell you they're very actively engaged in collecting data. If I were to guess that this new variant, there's a so limited amount of data available that they're collecting that data 
and my hope is that they'll be uh, uh, bringing that out to the public shortly. And, and I think there's a, a paucity of data right now on the new variant. But, but I'm, I'm certain that as soon as that gets out there, the, the CDC will, will be sharing that information uh, quite broadly. Yeah, thank you for that call. Like Dr. Gold said at the top of the show as well, by this time next week when we meet back here, we will probably have a lot more information. So make sure you stay tuned for that show as well. Janet from New York joins the conversation now. Thanks for joining us, Janet. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I hope I explained this right. I know that you can have a test for antibodies, and I found out tonight you can have a test for two different kinds of antibodies. But my question is I understand that you have your antibodies floating around in your blood, and that will show that you have antibodies that will stop this virus to some degree. But there's also T cells that create um, some kind of resistance to this virus, and that that doesn't show up. So how do I know that if my antibodies were low, that my T cells wouldn't do the job? Does that make any sense? <laughs> that absolutely makes very good sense, Janet. So what you're referring to is our bodies fight off infections in two different ways. We have what we call uh, humoral immunity, that is immunity uh, carried on by antibodies in our blood. And then we have what we call cellular immunity, sometimes called memory cells or amnestic immunity. And that's when our white blood cells, our so-called T cells and B cells, work together to memorize what these viruses, bacteria, fungal infections, etc., look like. They carry that. So, for instance, if you were exposed to measles or were vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, etc., uh, you would not likely have detectable antibodies, or they would be extremely low. But you would have the cellular function that when and if you ever saw any of these infectious agents, that those cells would start to build large quantities of antibodies and also the cellular response uh, to attack them. So we don't typically measure that because you would probably need a bone marrow biopsy, which you know, take it from me, if you can avoid having that done, it would be a really nice thing uh, to avoid. Uh, however, uh, the limited research that has been done has shown uh, that for individuals that are vaccinated, they have a much stronger T cell response than for individuals that were infected with COVID but were not vaccinated. And hence, that forms part of the very important argument of even if you previously have had the infection and tested positive, why you should still get fully vaccinated, and when your turn comes, why you should still get a booster shot. All right, thank you for that call. That about does it for us tonight. Dr. Cradiville, though, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share your final thoughts with our viewers. Uh, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And, uh, you know, you all expressed uh, a gratitude for us for what we do, but thank you all for your support, and thank you all for what you're doing to... Uh, help uh, fight COVID in your communities. And, and thanks for the great questions. Ah, that's wonderful. And Dr. Gold, did you have any final thoughts for us tonight? Uh, just to wish everybody the best uh, as we get into this holiday season. Uh, rest assured that we will continue to provide as current and as accurate information as we possibly can. Uh, this is going to be a fast-moving target. All right. Make sure you tune in for next week. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.